Hello. Uh, here at the Watkins Museum of History, we recently opened a new exhibit called Mothers of Invention, the Entrepreneurs and Innovators of Lawrence. In uh, connection with this new exhibit about local women who changed history, we've inv invited uh, Catherine Nemeth Tuttle to speak about Lawrence women in the 1890s. So hello, Catherine. Hello. Uh, and hello to all of you joining us online. Feel free to post some comments or questions if you'd like. Um, we will address them if we have time tonight, but if we don't end up having time for those, we apologize in advance. Uh, I think our guest today really needs no introduction for many of us. Uh, Dr. Catherine Nemeth Tuttle, Associate Vice Provost Emerita, was instrumental in efforts to improve academic advising, student academic support, and student persistence at the University of Kansas. Her research focus is the history of women in higher education. <clears throat> More recently, she has researched the history of women in Lawrence in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Catherine is a resident of Lawrence or has been a resident of Lawrence since 1968. She served as the president of the Douglas County Historical Society Board, where I work, and uh, president of the Old West Lawrence Association. She's also the co-author of the books Transforming the University of Kansas, A History, 1965 to 2015, and uh, a book titled Reflecting Back, Looking Forward, Civil Rights and Student Affairs. Catherine received her doctoral degree from KU and taught undergraduate and graduate courses for the School of Education. She was elected to the KU Women's Hall of Fame and was named a KU Woman of Distinction. Catherine and her husband, Bill, have four children and six grandchildren. Well, uh, Catherine, what do you say? Should we jump right into it? Yeah, I think that'd be great. Thank you, Will. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to uh, see you all virtually. I know this, uh, we're kind of... Uh, getting weary of this format, but I appreciate everybody coming along with us uh, today in this. And, and Will, if you could get the uh, PowerPoint going, that yes, would be will. great. Uh, let I wanted to explain uh, that this program actually developed out of my involvement with Friends and Council, a women's study group, uh, and we're celebrating our sesquicentennial, 150 years, and we thought our topic for this past year would be a, a good one to have a focus on 15 decades. And I ended up with the 1890s, which I actually am quite happy about because it's a, it's a, a important transitional uh, decade. And it was very important in Lawrence. And we have some history to reflect of that because of the souvenir history, which I'll talk about in a minute. So um I want to also say that there are some things because of our time and limits uh, that are, I'm not addressing. So just so you know, I'm not forgetting them, but there's just not time in, in the whole process for that. Um, I, I'm not really talking about Haskell and Native Americans and Lawrence, except uh, for a brief national reference. Uh, I don't really talk too much about pulp popular culture in the 1890s, but I hope I'm showing it here a little bit with the design on the screen. Uh, which is Art Nouveau, and Art Nouveau became uh, very popular in the 1890s. There were a lot of health issues in the 1890s in Lawrence, uh, which of course affected women deeply, uh, who were mothers. Diphtheria was a killer of infants and children, and there were also new advancements like the x-ray, which Dr. Bailey at KU uh, uh, championed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have as much here on women's suffrage, and there are others who have uh, led with that, and I'll reference them. So I do try to put Lawrence issues in tandem with national issues. So bear with me a little bit because there's a context for that. So let's go to the first slide, Will. And just remembering uh, or addressing some of the key national and state issues. It's interesting how many of these are reflected in our current decade. Uh, but there were many challenges with special interests. In this case, it was the railroad, steel, merchants and lawyers who exploited farmers and the greed of corporations. How many of you, you can raise your hands at home, watch The Gilded Age on HBO. Uh, you, get, you get the idea. Uh, and then to top it off, there was an economic depression, the panic of 1893, a lot of rural discontent, and we were an agricultural county then, so it affected us, leading to populism. Uh, and political exclusion for women, Blacks, Native Americans, immigrants, poor and educa uneducated, in 1890, the Mississippi Plan used poll taxes and literary 
literacy test to prevent African Americans from voting. Uh, it was a horrible uh, decade for lynchings, which increased significantly. And many of you know that Lawrence experienced this in 1882 when three men were lynched on the Caw River Bridge. And I encourage all of you to look at the remembrance exhibit at the Watkins related to that. Key Supreme Court decisions in this decade. Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, that established segregation in public accommodations and Cummins versus the Board of Education applied separate but equal to schools. So very uh, strong indication of where the decade was moving in terms of racial justice. Um, 1890 was also Wounded Knee Massacre in South Dakota. 146 Lakota Sioux men, women, and children were killed in an indiscriminate shooting. There were more medal medals of honor awarded for this uh, event than any other US military engagement, which is um, staggering. Later of the 150 Lakota who escaped, many died of hypothermia, and it was the end of what we would call the Indian Wars. Um, but the National American Women's Suffrage Association had formed uh, more women uh, by from 1870 to 1910. We have 11 states legalizing women's suffrage, mostly in the West, in the 1890s, Colorado and Idaho added uh, women to the voting rolls. Many of you know that Wyoming was the first, although it wasn't the first state, it was a territory. And when it entered the uh, union in 1890, there was a fight to, to maintain suffrage. And most of you know that Kansas did grant it to women in 1912. Next slide, please. So that economic depression, um, had uh, a big impact in Lawrence as well. And I need to thank Will for giving me some information about J.B. Watkins. Uh, but this widespread depression, there was also, also uh, numerous industrial strikes. Uh, one of the most terrific was the Latimer massacre, the violent death of 19 unarmed immigrant coal miners near Hazleton, Pennsylvania in 1897. And the miners, mostly Polish, Slovak, and Lithuanian ethnicity, were killed by the Lucerne County Sheriff's Posse. It was a turning point for the United Mine Workers. And that was just one example. One of them that you might know actually from a musical was the 1899 Newsboy strike in New York City. Newsboys were considered to be independent contractors and they had to pay for their own papers. And guess what? Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst raised the prices on them. 5,000 newsboys rallied and some were subjected to violence. So what's happening in Lawrence? Well, we're growing modestly. In 1890, there's about 9,997 people here. Uh, by 1900, there were just 10,862. And actually across Kansas, uh, the population declined in this decade, uh, largely, I think, because of the depression. Um, but we have um, the failure of the Watkins land mortgage, uh, and this was based on farm mortgages. And then we have the buyout and closing of Consolidated Barbed Wire Company uh, due to the large trust of U.S. Steel monopolizing the industry and cutting off supply. I've had an interest in, in uh, Consolidated Barbed Wire Company, which is now Abe and Jake's, because the people that built that, the Henleys, Albert Henley, uh, built the Barbed Wire Company. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit more about JB and what happened. And he's really our... Lawrence entrepreneur extraordinaire, as I call him. Um, but J.B. Watkins and the failure of the Watkins land mortgage and National Bank, um, they were bundling Western farm mortgages. And there's really quite a similarity to um, the housing subprime market of 2008. For any of you that remember that, very similar. Um, the farmers had no ability to pay back their loans. The pop Kansas population was declining. But Watkins recovered with Louisiana land purchases that produced oil and gas. But it was Elizabeth Watkins who actually managed all the funds and paid off his debts after his death. So we need to thank Elizabeth uh, for the Watkins building, for her uh, support of uh, hospitals, both on campus and in the community, for the scholarship halls. So that was an important part of it. Of course, the building in the next slide, please. Um, is something that we can all enjoy today as the Watkins Museum of History, but it was an extraordinary edifice built to attract Eastern investors and demonstrate his wealth to Lawrence bankers. He didn't get along very well with Bowersock and the Lawrence National Bank, which was at the other end of Mass to Chusa Street, but it's a wonderful example of Richardsonian Romanesque 
Um, I think uh, it makes the experience of going to the Watkins Museum of History unique. So if you haven't been inside lately, please go. Elizabeth Watkins gave it to the city and from 1929 to 1970, it was City Hall. I've talked to many people that paid their bills there. They got their vaccinations there. Uh, and then in, it opened as the Watkins Community Museum of History in 1975. And just one more quick slide showing JB in his lobby. So let's go to the next slide. The, uh, the other um, panic issue that eventually affected uh, the Consolidated Barbed Wire Company. And this is a picture of the new factory actually that was completed in 1895 there on the left. If you can see it on the very far left of that, is the uh, water power wheel. So this is water power that's uh, uh, allowing these companies along the river to, to, to exist. And in the center of, the, of that picture, you see the uh, train track. So it's very convenient for getting that barbed wire out west and all around the country. And then on the right, you see the interior with the co coiled wire that was going to be made into barbed wire. But actually, this company was... Uh, survived the panic of 1893. They were, their, they were the largest employer in Kansas at one time with 375 people. But as I mentioned, what, what would become U.S. Steel wanted a monopoly. And monopolies were very popular in the 1890s. And they refused to give them the raw goods that they needed, the, the steel rods. Um, Albert Henley turned them down twice, but finally gave in. And uh, the new owners, of course, um, reduced pri raised prices, cut wages, and fired workers, as you can expect. And they moved out of town in under two years. So it was very devastating for the Lawrence economy uh, that this closed. Next slide, please. So let's talk just briefly about populism, because uh, this was affecting farmers in Kansas and affecting the whole national scene. It was a response to the economic downturn, the crop failures, the drought low prices. And in 1890, the Farmers Alliance in the Great Plains had 2 million members. And this became then the People's Party. And Kansas was the center. Kansas was the center of Midwest populism. I think uh, my husband, Bill, had a, a graduate student from Japan who came here to study populism in Kansas because this was, this was the epicenter. Um, and in 1892, the populace actually won all the Kansas governorship and swept all the statewide office, offices, including the senator and a U.S. representative. But I want to make the point, since we're trying to focus on women to that tonight, that fearless women led the way. So let's talk first, in the next slide, please, about Mary Lease. And some of you may have heard about her. She was a fiery, fiery orator. Here are some of her more famous quotations. Wall Street owns the country. The great common people of the country are slaves and the monopoly and monopoly is the master. And then the other one uh, is po possibly apocryphal, but uh, it's her most famous quotation attributed to her. Farmers should raise less corn and more hell. And she was very much like that in her talk, in her public speaking. Um, she had four children. Uh, she lived in Wichita. She believed in racial and gender equality. Uh, and she gave the second, second, seconding speech for the presidential nomination of James Weaver in 1892. Um, at the convention in Omaha, they focused on inequality that threatened to splinter the American society. And uh, when I hear and read about her, I think of Bernie Sanders a lot. Um, she call, they called at this uh, convention for a graduated income tax, direct election of U.S. senators, the eight-hour workday, universal suffrage. Uh, so um, these were very important themes for the populist. In that election of 1892, Weaver got 8% of the vote, but he got all 22 electoral votes. I'm sorry, he and, and 22 electoral votes. I don't know how many were from Kansas, but all the electoral votes from Kansas went to Weaver, went to populist. So next slide, please. And I had to put this one in of uh, Mary Lee's in her lovely gown there. Next slide. But our homegrown populist was Annie Diggs, and I hope you've heard of her. Um, we do not ask for sympathy or pity. We ask for justice. Uh, real reform must come from the education of the people. And she was um, uh, persistent in her speaking all across the country about these issues. And she thought that the populists were, were grappling with dealings between exploiters and the exploited. So it was very strong language. She was a Kansas poet, 
author, newspaper woman, temperance worker, and populist advocate. Uh, she was born in Canada, moved to Lawrence, um, married a postal worker. Yay, postal workers. My uh, son is one. And uh, she started with temperance and actually was Unitarian minister for a year. But then she became much more interested in agrarian issues, living here in Douglas County, recognizing the plight of the farmers and turned to populism. And she lectured about populism, temperance and suffrage throughout the country. She attended that same conference or convention in Omaha in 1892. And she was president of the Kansas Equal Suffrage Association the Kansas Woman's Press Association, and she also served as state librarian in Kansas from 1898 to 1902. So uh, quite an extraordinary woman. Um, KU Professor Joan Stone has done a wonderful first-person presentation about her several years ago, and, uh, and, and she's certainly worthy of that. Next slide, please. So talking just briefly about suffrage in Kansas during this decade, um, see. Um, these two photographs, I think, explain it well. Um, on, the, on the left, we have an announcement for a mass meeting of the women, Women's Suffrage Amendment, uh, which was um, up for vote in 1894. Who was voting for it? Men. And uh, it was for the third time turned down in Kansas. I, I was intrigued by this poster because this is a meeting in Waukini, Kansas, and I'm from Western Kansas myself. I'm from Overland. This is way out there uh, by Hayes. So uh, you can see that some of the leading suffragists of the day were there. Carrie Chapman Catt, our own Annie or the Anna Annie Diggs and Therese Jenkins. Now, Therese Jenkins was the woman who fought for maintaining suffrage in uh, Wyoming when they entered the uh, union as a state. Um, in uh, let's see, so the constitutional amendment failed that fall. Uh, the vote was 58% against and 42% for. It actually lost by 4,000 votes in Douglas County. So, lest you think we were particularly progressive in this, we weren't. Uh, two previous attempts in 60, 1867 and 1887 also failed. I need to especially thank and recognize Jean Klein for her excellent research on this issue and establishing Douglas County as the center of suffrage efforts in Kansas. <clears throat> on the right is the famous... Um, picture of suffragists in, here in Lawrence at the Douglas County Fair in 1912. And they included uh, friends and council members, Mary Broughton Brooks, and also Mary Ransom Strong, who was the wife of the chancellor. And uh, the chancellor Strong was quite supportive of women's suffrage. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so populism, um, uh, really ended with McKinley's election as president in 1896. But we, uh, I think, can be heartened by knowing that the populist principles prevailed a decade later through progressivism. We have the graduated income tax, we have direct election of senators, and we have women's suffrage coming uh, between 1913 and 1920, and all of those were populist goals. Next slide, please. But in Kansas, there were also some direct um, and, and important impacts on working people and even farmers. So the eight hour workday was in place for governmental units, coal mine regulations, weekly payment of wages, laws to support farmers and ranchers, safe elected election practices, railroad and antitrust legislation. So um, it wasn't, even though the, it died out in terms of uh, political popularity, uh, it had an impact in Kansas and in the state. Um, the feeling was, and this is a quote, that the business classes would feel there, nothing progressive could come from farmers and factory workers. So there was a classism about it um, that affected them throughout. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about African-Americans in Lawrence in the 1890s. And uh, and um, placing this with the fact that 25% of the Lawrence population were African-Americans, so a significant part of our population. Lawrence was home to black lawyers, doctors, police officers, teachers, office and sto store workers. 
And of course, KU attracted uh, students from Missouri, Oklahoma, and other Southern states that excluded Blacks. So we had that going for us. But the Free State Bastion always segregated and excluded. And uh, there was a growing de facto, there, were, there was growing de facto segregation in the 1890s, unfortunately. Even so, threads of our abolitionist history live on in lives of Lawrence individuals. So let's take a look at a few of those. <coughs> One of the more flamboyant that you probably have heard of, he's frequently in the 125 years ago uh, little notes in the Lawrence Journal World, Sam Jeans. Uh, he had several titles, but one of them was Assistant Chief of Police. And this is from the 1898 Souvenir History. Next slide, please. And um, he was really remarkable. He was known as Lawrence's Sherlock Holmes. He was a government team driver on the battlefield three days after Custer's massacre and recovered soldiers' bodies. So he had a career in the military. Uh, there was an article in a 1902 newspaper lauding him. He is recognized as one of the best all-round officers in the West. He succeeded in capturing some of the worst criminals in Kansas. He is the only man in that vicinity that the criminal element fears. He faces race prejudice, but Lawrence people, quote, admire his courage, manhood, and ability as an officer. He owns two residences at Mississippi and Warren, which is 9th Street. He is proud of his race and glad he is a black man. So quite uh, one of our extraordinary citizens and law officers. Uh, next slide, please. Another direct connection with KU uh, and African-American students going there is John W. Clark, Exoduster, attorney, first lieutenant, judge. He came to Kansas as a six-year-old exoduster in 1878, and he graduated from KU's law department. In 1896, the first African-American to do so. He served in Cuba in 1898 in the famous all-black 23rd Kansas Volunteer Infantry. We had a wonderful exhibit about that at the Watkins a few years ago. He practiced law in Kansas for the next 30 years, and also served as a justice of the peace. Next slide, please. Some of the more <clears throat> outstanding members uh, in our community were the Harvey family, the Harvey brothers. Their parents were freed from slavery and started farming near Blue Mound, east of Lawrence in 1873, and eventually owned 100 acres. Uh, they sent all three sons to KU. One of the stories I heard that was very touching was that from their farm, they could see Fraser Hall the old Frazier, <clears throat> rising on the hill. And they vowed that all their sons would go, and they did. Sherman Harvey graduated in 1889, and he was also a captain in the Spanish-American War and later graduated from KU Law. Uh, and But due to women being able to vote in municipal elections since 1887, Sherman was elected district court clerk, and he selected Carrie Langston as his deputy. And I'll talk more about Carrie. But Frederick Grant Harvey studied pre-med at KU, but of course he couldn't go to KU med school. So he graduated from med school in uh, Texas. And then Ed Harvey, and he is pictured in this photograph on the KU football team. He is on the back row, third from the left. Uh, he lettered in football and baseball. But in just a few years, uh, KU would start to segregate their athletic teams there was a so-called gentleman's agreement. I don't know what kind of gentleman they were, I guess racist gentlemen, who uh, agreed jointly that since we, the Southern sympathies of uh, our conference uh, colleagues in Missouri and Oklahoma wouldn't stand uh, an integrated team. So that led to us having segregated teams for decades. Uh, next slide, please. Mamie Dillard, I think, uh, could be seen as one of the uh, outstanding educators in Lawrence history. Um, she was born in Lawrence, 1874, and died here in 1954. She gradu graduated from Lawrence in 1892, and she was the only African-American in her class. As part of the ceremony, she delivered a speech in support of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and she had joined a segregated WCTU at the age of 18 and also promoted women's suffrage. In fact, she worked with Carrie Langston on that issue. Uh, she, she got her BA from KU in 1896, started her career at Pinckney Elementary, where she taught in a segregated classroom. And one of her students was Langston Hughes. 
Um, she befriended and corresponded with him for years. From 1909 to 1913, she attended KU grad school and studied English and special education. And then with her master's became principal of the segregated Lincoln School in North Lawrence. She was an active club woman and she was a member of the Self Culture Club, the Sierra Leone Club, and KU chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Um, she lived at 520 Louisiana in a house that was built by her father, and that house is still standing today. And next slide shows you some of the students at Lincoln School a little bit later than the 1890s, but it gives you a sense of the student body. Next slide, please. Of course, we all know about Langston Hughes, maybe the story of her, his mother, Carrie Langston Hughes, is a little less known in terms of her life in Lawrence. Uh, her mother was Mary Le Leary, who lived here in Lawrence. And at 15, Carrie was a belle of Black society in Lawrence. At 18, she recited poetry and read papers and was central to Lawrence's St. Luke's Progressive Club. In 1892, she was writing for an African-American paper, The Atchison Blade, and refuted, quote, the male notion that females were content with their position in life. So she was a fem early feminist. Uh, her, fa her, her writing was influenced by her father, Charles Langston, who supported the 1867 Kansas suffrage referendum. And as I mentioned, she served as de deputy clerk in the district court. She married James Hughes, but by the time their son Langston was born in Joplin, Missouri in 1902, her husband had left for uh, Mexico. Mary, mother and son returned to Lawrence in 1907, where he was cared for by her mother, Mary Leary. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the uh, souvenir history, and uh, this is an extraordinary historical reference for all of us. And I'm, I'm very, I don't have it here, but I'm very lucky to have an original copy. Um, but it showed Lawrence's economic recovery. It featured many successful businesses, homes, schools, and college. It illustrated many talented professionals, including African-Americans and women. And it pictured horses and carriages as the mainstays for travel, but hinted at changes to come. So next slide, this just is the cover of that book with E.F. Caldwell was an attorney who also served as a Lawrence postmaster who put the book together. And then the next page, next slide please, is the uh, title page of that wonderful book. Next page, please. So let's kind of, this is not from the um, souvenir history, but I wanted to put it in because we're going to uh, talk briefly about some of the important businesses in Lawrence and some of them had women employees. Uh, this is the wonderful postcard collection, the Fitzpatrick Postma postcard collection and is available online through the Lawrence Public Library. And um, so when you see these colored postcards, you know it's probably not the 1890s. This is a little later, 1900s and 1910s. But on the left here uh, is the Consolidated Barbed Wire Factory. And on the right is the Bowersock Mill and Plant. All right, next slide, please. And then we'll just look at some of these wonderful companies that were existing then, the Wilder Brothers Shirt Factory, I think there was something in the paper recently, wasn't there, about it being sold again. I hope they repurpose it in a, in an in a appropriate way because it's an amazing building. As many of you know that it was, for, a t for many years, the Reuter Organ Factory. Next slide, please. Um, and the Boner Brothers Cigar Factory. Um, by 1905, there were four cigar factories in Lawrence. There must have been a lot of guys uh, smoking um cigars. And there were 200 in Kansas. So it's really quite amazing. I don't have the right photo here because there is one that shows a woman at work in one of these, but the next one is another one of the cigar factories, the Hearn or Hone Cigar Factory at 837 Massachusetts. With a, um, but several women were employed in making cigars in Lawrence. Um, the next page I uh, borrowed from Brittany Keegan, who's done uh, just a wonderful job with the exhibit currently at the museum. But this is directly from the souvenir history. And they're very proud. If you can see in small type, probably it's hard to read. It says, um, young women uh, in, uh, in important positions. So I'm having trouble reading it myself. Um, young women in responsible positions. So they're, they're featuring these women uh, for example, the woman at the top 
left, worked at the uh, barbed wire factory. Uh, women working for attorneys and the city clerk's office and the deputy clerk of the court. So they were uh, showing uh, in their fine dress here, in cases, some cases hats, uh, women uh, who are making a difference in the workplace in Lawrence. And uh, next slide, uh, I just I want to say this again. Uh, if you go back just one, Will, I'm sorry, that this um, Brittany's exhibit, Mothers of Invention, Entrepreneurs and Innovators of Lawrence, is just an amazing opportunity to learn. I'm not talking too much um, about the uh, any of these women tonight, but I, you need to take the opportunity to see this exhibit because whether we're talking about um, the Soul Sisters and their the Soul Sisters and their home store, music stores, the black-owned businesses, but uh, bakeries, seamstresses, uh, proprietors of the Cottage Hotel. Uh, I think I'll be talking about Ida Hyde, and we'll see, hear more about her. Uh, Harriet Hopper. Harper, who was a black, was a black owned, black owned, illegally operated taxi service. Uh, Aunt Jane Williams had a bar and brothel in East Lawrence in an area called the East Bottoms. Uh, she operated from the 1880s to 1918. She was known as the Queen of the Bottoms. And Dennis Domer has got a really wonderful chapter about her in the forthcoming history of Lawrence, um, as well as um, inventors like Mary McCullough. Um, but it also features some of our women who have been so important in our modern businesses, like Susan Milstein, Betty Ray's, Judy Paley, and Sarah Feynman. So please take some time to see that. It'll be there through October 11th. Okay, next slide. And this is, uh, uh, the reason I put this in here be, is because it shows the downtown uh, tracks for the horse-drawn trolleys uh, and Fraser Hall in the distance. So this is very quintessential Lawrence. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, of course, the, the banks were important, but this also, the one on the right, this picture of the Merchants National Bank at Massachusetts and Henry State, which was eighth, uh, shows that horse-drawn trolley. Okay, the next next slide, please. And this is, this is a really interesting photo um, because it shows the horse-drawn trolley, uh, but it's a historic parade. So this is the 75th anniversary of Lawrence in 1929. And at the very far right of the photo, you can see our brand new electric uh, streetcars, which were a part of uh, Lawrence for a couple of decades. So um, that was important too for Lawrence. Let's see, next slide, please. But uh, horses were still the main way of travel. Uh, we had four, at least four livery stables, Donnelly Brothers, Clarks, Hamlins, Beal and Goddings. Uh, and this is the one that uh, this building, part of it became uh, at one time Borders. Uh, I think that's going to be the new headquarters for Doug Conklin's operation. Marcy Francisco's grandfather, W.J., was the first Democratic mayor of Lawrence, and he ran a livery in the 800 block of Vermont. So the 18 Ice was still very much about horses. But the next slide shows you something's coming. And I hope you can see this because it, it's really uh, quite uh, wonderful. Um, they, uh, this is the uh, Herman Horse Collar Factory Workers, and they are very proud of their um, uh, what they're producing. But if you look at the left, you can see a gentleman with his bicycle. So uh, this is a, a, a this is a picture of uh, change. Uh, that these horse, horse collars are not going to need to be produced in that volume very long, but bicycles would be. More on bicycles shortly. Um, and just one quick uh, slide of the uh, Louisiana Street looking north from Winthrop. You can see in the distance there uh, a horse-drawn carriage. And of course, if you've been on that street, you know that there are stone hitching posts that still exist. Next slide. So women in Lawrence, um, besides the business women that are portrayed in uh, the Mothers of Invention exhibit, a huge area for them was in, in the libraries or with education. <coughs> and Mary Frances Simpson was a Lawrence City librarian from 1885 to 1902. She was a Friends and Council charter member, a suffragist, an active presenter, and she was followed by Nellie Griswold Beatty. Uh, the next slide, please. 
shows uh, the original Lawrence City Library, which was on the second floor of the Lawrence National Bank. And this was still a subscription library. So we didn't have the publicly funded free library yet. But the reading rooms, reading rooms were free for anyone to use, and there were about 8,000 volumes. And then finally, uh, we have the Carnegie uh, Public Free Public Library opening in 1902. And this is a wonderful photograph. Uh, in the middle is Nellie Griswold Beatty. So the lineage of Friends and Council with the Lawrence Public Library is pretty amazing. Helen Griswold, Rhoda Trask, Mary Frances Simpson and Nellie Griswold Beatty served in succession from 1867 to 1917. And the other thing to consider is that every single the, every single one of these women uh, were survivals survivors of the Lawrence Massacre. So their own lives, and some of them were widows, uh, had been tragically affected by Quantrill, uh, and yet they they persevered, and their courage and their Persistence is something to admire today. Uh, next slide, please. Another place that women played a role, of course, was in education and teaching. And this was the very impressive Central School at 905 Kentucky. Uh, the, the stone base of this building, I believe, still exists in the office building that's at the corner of 9th and Kentucky. And then next slide, we will see the pretty amazing Lawrence High School that was across the street at 906 Kentucky. It opened in 1890. The bond election of $35,000 had 950 yes votes and 140 no. So Lawrence was supporting uh, high school education at that time. And there were several uh, women teachers at uh, Lawrence High School. Next slide, please. This is from the Souvenir History. And uh, six of the nine high school teachers featured were women. And the next uh, page is also, next slide please, is from the uh, souvenir history as well. And this shows several women who were uh, principals of what they called ward schools. We would, I, in my, when I was growing up, we called a grade school is usually uh, first grade through eighth grade. Uh, but three of the seven ward principals were women. Uh, next slide, please. I won't talk too much about KU, but I do want to talk about an important woman, a couple of important women at KU. And in the 1890s, uh, Frances H. Snow was chancellor uh, after 24 years as a faculty member, an original faculty member. He was really an eminent uh, natural scientist, and he presided over the abolition of the abolition of the preparatory department, which really made KU kind of a high school for a few years. And created the College of Arts and Sciences, Schools of Engineering, Law, Fine Arts, Pharmacy, and very importantly, the grad school. Uh, so his, his tenure, uh, which was um, until almost uh, over a decade, until 1902, in this photo, a snow is on the right, uh, Strong, who will succeed him, is on the middle, and Lippincott, who preceded him, is on the left. And let's go and talk, though, about uh, Snow's wife, extraordinary in her own right, Jane Snow. She was a founding member of Friends and Council. She served on the first, first program committee for the group and wrote a wide range of papers. Um, she, was, she made great contributions to her husband's administration, led the Faculty Wives Women's League, and also, in the meantime, was the mother of six children. She also had a lot of health problems, apparently, but uh, that's another thing to think about in terms of these women, whether they're helping uh, with the campus or in a school or in a library or downtown as businesswomen, many of them had children and trying to manage all of that at the same time, uh, extraordinary. I'm, I'm indebted to uh, Friends and Council member Georgiana Glinsky, who's done significant research on the history of our founding members. Next slide, please. I put this one in just because it's interesting. This uh, snow led uh, expeditions of KU students out to uh, research labs in Colorado on a regular basis. And um, this one uh, features snow on the right with his butterfly net. He was, his, he was an entomologist. Uh, there are at least four women who braved uh, the uh, donkeys and everything else to be a part of this picture. And the gentleman on the far left of this picture is William Allen White. Uh, probably ca uh, Kansas's most famous uh, newspaper editor in Emporia. 
Next slide, please. Ida Hyde deserves a, a book of her own, really. Uh, she was a professor of zoology. She was the chair of the department. Uh, outstanding physiologist. She was probably the first woman to be awarded a German PhD. And she certainly was the first woman member of the American Physiological Society, 1902. She was a public health advocate and she fought for KU women students, staff and faculty. She was a non-traditional student. She was, her family were German Jewish immigrants and they lost everything in the Chicago fire of 1870. Uh, she enrolled in Cornell at the age of 31 for her BA, so non-traditional. She was an extraordinary researcher and teacher. Um, she uh, lectured widely on public health, TB, meningitis, uh, lectured on hygiene throughout Kansas, openly discussed human sexuality and sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, her research was groundbreaking. She demanded that KU women KU hire women janitors and promote the hiring of women corrections officers in Kansas. So she was uh, an extraordinary woman, but her life at KU as a faculty member was quite challenging as a woman. Uh, she got a letter from Kate Stevens, another woman faculty member saying, she and I have been pricked by the same thorns for both of us have been women professors in the University of Kansas. And Ida Hyde's memoir is entitled before women were human beings. So quite extraordinary. Next slide, please. Catherine, we're at about 40 minutes. Okay, great. So we need to move ahead. Why don't we just, uh, this? let's move ahead. And these are just some uh, pictures of the uh, students at play and graduation and boarding clubs, which were co-ed. And that's pretty interesting that men and women were living together. Uh, societal and cultural changes in the 1890s. Um, the, which were very much a part of the Columbian Exposition at the Chicago's World Fair, mechanization. What affected women, I think possibly, and the most in some ways was the typewriter, which became uh, uh, very much a part of the office experience in the 1880s. And women were thought to have that dexterity uh, to operate those machines well. And you can see uh, in just that 20 year period from 1880 to 1900, uh, the number of employed women soared from 2.6 to 8.6, pretty uh, amazing. But there's also time for leisure because the work week was shortened. So baseball, basketball, and then the bicycle craze. Next slide, please. And a lot of societal and cultural changes, the electric trolleys, which Lawrence didn't get till 1910. But these are just a few of the things. A lot of the Lawrence Journal World 125 years ago talk about the telephones, getting the telephones operating, uh, flush toilets, street lights, goods, importantly for women, more ready to wear clothes. Restrictive Victorian clothing was fading away. Women needed shirt waist for work and comfortable clothes for riding bicycles, even bloomers. So next, let's look at a few here if we have time. And this was perhaps the old model, the Kappa Kappa Gamma uh, class uh, of 1891. Next slide. Uh, but here we see the shirt waist, which much less flourish, uh, more, less restrictive undergarments. Next slide. Um, and here we have African-American women in the 1890s popular dress, uh, a dress that would work for the office, wouldn't it? Uh, a place of work, uh, you would be professional, but it wouldn't be too restrictive. Next slide. Um, I love this one of the librarians in Toronto. Uh, looking very professional, but uh, also like they're ready to work. Next slide, please. And a person who championed this lived right here in Lawrence. She was a great champion, great suf suffragist, uh, uh, Genevieve Hallen Chalkley. She was a member of Friends and Council. And uh, she uh, was uh, one of the uh, people who were championing the rational dress movement and dress reform. And in 1895, she actually gave a talk at Friends and Council about this uh, and said that uh, some of the efforts before had been ineffectual because it mostly had focused on women who were adventurers, but it should be for everyday people. Uh, and she herself wore a short skirt. Now, what was a short skirt in 1895? It was a skirt who, that brushed her ankles. <laughs> And uh, she had gaiters or leggings underneath it. But people, I think these friends and council members might have been a little um, surprised uh, by her uh, very brazen wearing of a, a, a dress that was uh, just grazing her ankles. 
Uh, next one, please. But here's some examples of why they needed these practical dress reform on the court, whether it was tennis or basketball, KU women students. And another reason they need it was because of bicycles. So the bicycle craze, next slide, please. Uh, in 1885, we had the creation of the safety bicycle. And here I'm very indebted to Brittany Keegan and her rolling revolution exhibit. And she shared information with me. And by 1900, Americans owned over 2 mi 10 million bicycles. <coughs> it was really a revolution as the last quote says. Next slide, please. Uh, just some pictures of these women cyclists. Next slide. And then Lawrence, it hit big. Uh, it gave young people more independence. And now with the new electric streetlights, they could stay up after dark. We had state ride bicycle races that were hosted here. And they actually, the Lawrence Bicycle Club founded in 1882, still functions and gives its has its annual Octo Octogenta in the fall. There were frequent problems, however, with bicycles, frightening horses, and collisions. Next slide, please. Just casual photographs of Laurentians with their bicycle. Next one. Uh, and uh, however, uh, there were some concerns about women and uh, what they were doing on their bicycles. Uh, they could travel farther, but they were seen as new women or new nat pneumatic women. This is both a compliment and an insult. Uh, bicycles are ridden astride, not side saddles. So this shocked the traditional notions of modesty. Next slide, please. Um, and there were also fa false risks. They said it would prevent pregnancy. It would be too pleasurable and lead to deviant behaviors, behaviors riding your bicycle. Uh, doctors cautioned about bicycle fakes that could cause facial damage and a worn expression, also lead to palpitations, heartaches, and depression. When I saw this material that uh, Brittany shared with me, it reminded me of Dr. Edward Clark, a Harvard professor, who said in 1873 that higher education and using the brain would damage a woman's, quote, female apparatus. So the challenges and uh, demands to control women's bodies have been around for a very long time indeed. Next slide, please. Uh, but the Lawrence Journal world seemed to be pretty uh, uh, supportive of the women. Uh, there were emporiums where you could learn how to ride. There was a bicycle parade and they were uh, praising uh, Lawrence as a place where the only place in the state that can boast of a team of lady tandem riders. Next slide. And when a British author complained about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this shows the two types of bicycles, uh, Francis Kennedy with her girl's bike and Lawrence Kennedy with his boy's bike. Um, so uh, when a when a English author uh, talked about these women uh, being red faced and vulgar, the Lawrence Journal World said they they she should see Lawrence's beautiful and graceful young lady cyclist. She would picture her as a heroine of her next novel. So I think I'm going to uh, and here's a nice uh, photo of, of two women in their bicycles. Um, I was going to have some information on the. Um, Kansas Pavilion, which had a huge component of women, women artists. But let's just go through these slides quickly. Uh, Will we did have county every count, many counties in Kansas had women's committees, and the uh, fair featured a woman, uh, a woman's building designed by a female architect. Next slide, please. Um, and um, so it was the Kansas Pavilion uh, was well received with their art. We had populous people there, and that's some of the example of the art that was uh, used from uh, the Woodwards, whose home is now where Sprague Apartments is. Next slide, please. Uh, and the biggest hit was actually, as you probably imagine, uh, uh, Lewis Lindsay Dyke's Panorama of North American Animals. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how it appeared. 10 to 12,000 people a day would come through the Kansas uh, Pavilion just to see this. So, and of course you can see it if you go to the Natural History Museum tomorrow. So next slide. Uh, and, and we see that uh, the decade closing, but we are, um, the progressive era it, it implements many of those things that the populace called for and women took a, a larger role in that. The women's club movement 
uh, had a notion of municipal housekeeping, so improving um, their community, and this happened in Lawrence. And Lawrence women continued to lead the way in Kansas through the progressive era. And the final slide, please. And I like this one. This is a lovely picture of Mrs. Violet McCone uh, on 9th Street, enjoying the best of Lawrence in the 1890s with her hammock and her bicycle. So thank you very much. And uh, I know we don't have too much time for questions, but if there are any, I'm glad to um, yeah, respond or anything that you have, Will. Yes, Catherine, uh, thank you. I had a question. So you you mentioned a little offhand uh, that women could vote in municipal elections I be in Kansas, I mm -hmm. believe. That was the terminology. Could you speak yeah. a little bit more about that? Well, I'm not the expert in this, but, and I think that um, uh, Jean Klein has done a lot of research on this, but uh, in our in the Kansas constitution, uh, women in, had the right to vote for school board is my understanding. And so uh, in, in they, they were, it was like stepping up. And so each, they, try to expand women's opportunities for voting. So even though we were um, um, turning down the statewide referenda on this for three, three different times, they gradually increased the opportunity. So those municipal elections led to uh, the mayor of Argonia, right? Is that the right name? I think I got the right town, yes. uh, being the first woman mayor in Kansas. So you're right. Very good point that women were, gra and then there was an early woman mayor um, in Baldwin, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. I'm, I'm not the expert in this, but uh, it certainly did lay the groundwork, I think, as women became more involved, whether they were doing it in a business on Mass Street or whether they were doing it through a club, uh, they knew their role was important even before they could vote uh, in, in statewide elections. Well, um, Catherine, thank you so much for taking us back to the 1890s tonight. And you're right, there are some stunning parallels with today. Right. And uh, yeah, that's that's very fascinating. So, and I really appreciate you um, giving uh, a promotion for our new exhibit, uh, Mothers of Invention, as well. That's great. So, okay. yes, by all means, everyone who's uh, in the area, please come out and see that exhibit. Uh, we'll be open uh, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, 10 to 4 p.m. And uh, thank you to everyone out there as well for joining us tonight for this excellent presentation. So I'll just say uh, again, thank you, Catherine, for giving well, us your time yeah, tonight. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. All right. So thanks again and bye for now. Bye.